Well, uh, John was teasing me at the beginning of the uh, service because I confessed to him that I've uh, hardly had this much trouble uh, getting a sermon together as I have this one. And I was uh, just really putting in the effort, but not feeling like I was getting anywhere. So I decided, uh, finally, I, I came to a point where I thought, you know what? Maybe the questions that I have that are making it difficult for me to talk about this are what I need to share. So this is kind of like a, a, long, a sermon that is the reasons the dog ate my homework and I don't have it done. It's kind of like that. And, the, and I was particularly befuddled by this because of all of the portions of the vision statement, I think maybe I had the most input into this phrase, to equip Christians for discipleship. And so it's really confounding when you get tripped up on it yourself. Yeah. Now, we're talking about our vision series, and now can we do it together? We are a community of servants called by God's reconciling grace to open doors of sanctuary, to create new avenues of ministry, to equip Christians for discipleship, and to lead reconciling ministries. So this is to equip Christians for discipleship. And I really, really was drawn, um, and in fact, maybe the first thing in the vision process that really came with me and stuck with me was that a core part of who we are and our mission and ministry and our essence is sanctuary, a safe place for healing, for encountering God. And I think that because I was so drawn to that, I also felt it really necessary to put in this second part about equipping Christians for discipleship because there's something about sanctuary that is so wonderful, such a relief, so uh, welcome of a break from the rest of life that it can be a little bit like a cocoon where we just want to stay and the church can get curved in upon itself, which can be really pleasant but it's probably not ultimately fulfilling our God-given purpose. And somehow, I wanted to make sure that the bigger vision of taking what it is that creates sanctuary out into the world is part of the core of who we are, that we are helping people move back out into the world with equipment that they've gained from the time in the community of faith. And uh, equipment uh, was a word, as you heard Jeff say in Ephesians, uh, it was a good biblical language taken right from Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 11, or uh, verse 12, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Changed it around a little bit. I know what Paul means when he calls all believers saints, but uh, probably there are many people, you, like I, who don't feel comfortable being, being called a saint, so just Christians. And rather than for the work of ministry, which sounded a little bit, a little bit too like professional ministry, we've, we've labeled, we've taken that term and applied it to people who have a specific employment roles in churches, um, and, and I wanted to take it and make it discipleship, that we're all disciples for everyone. So that was the, the goal. But as soon as I started trying to work with the words, I found a lot of things that were bugging me. And the first one was equip. Uh, because it sounds, I think I liked it because it, it has a little bit of, you know, uh, teeth to it. It sounds concrete. But I immediately realized that I was starting to think about equipment. And, and I started thinking about my own experiences with trying to do hard stretching things and equipment. Uh, so like, how many people have bought treadmills in January <laughs> because you intend to exercise, 
but the equipment is not the main problem. <laughs> Myself today, I have at different points in my life had good exercise routines. I've been trying, kind of trying for like six months to get back into one because I'm starting to really realize the effects of not. And, and I, I've tried, oh, look at this kind of exercise or that kind of exercise or try this studio or that studio, thinking if I get the right equipment in place, get this room set up in the house. And it's really dawning on me that it is not about equipment at all. <laughs> the most important work of any action begins inside with the conception and the motivation to do it. Um, it's really, really cheesy. It's, there was this lay person at my home church, and every now and then he would hand these little things out. He'd just give them to you here. What is that, Lois? Two it's. It is, yeah. Do you, you, two it's. Is it a square to it? Oh, circle. It's a circle to it. It's a... It's a round to it. It's a round to it. And he would hand, hand these little wooden coins out, the round to it. And, and uh, you know, it, it was really cheesy, but I still remember it. And it really jumped back into my head as I was thinking about equipment. Maybe one of the most important pieces of equipment we need is the round to it. Making something a priority. We'll come back to that with Paul. So perhaps equipment was bugging me because I was thinking that's going to be a temptation to think that we need some extraordinary insider gadget or program to get us really moving as disciples. And of course, I'm reading that through my own lazy screen of exercise. But it's also because probably some of the things that we are called to do as a disciple make us feel a little bit stretched, a little vulnerable. Now, you know, if you come here at all on Sunday morning, you know that Marlene, our small bundle of magnificent energy, who <laughs> seems to know where everything is at the church and is so capable and eager to help. Um, Marlene, God love her, this year she decided to try being a reading buddy. And um, this was her first week. And I was so tickled, I finally realized Marlene did not feel very confident doing something. She, she came up to me several times to say, I'm starting my reading buddy. Now, what am I supposed to do? And she'd been through the training, but it's just a little bit uncomfortable to go try to do something new. And some of the things that we might think about doing as disciples might just feel a little bit stretching, uncomfortable and new. And so it's easy not to, not to get started. So I thought equipment, putting that right there, it's giving us a little bit of a, a distraction from, from what the main purpose is. I may want to use a different word there. And then my next problem <clears throat> that I encountered was that this word equipment and from Ephesians uh, is from a passage where it's talking about the gifts that are given. And, and I realized that um, uh, it was part of Paul's language about spiritual gifts. Um, and there are three different places in the scriptures where it, it has kind of lists of spiritual gifts in Paul's letters to the uh, churches he wrote to. In 1 Corinthians, there are two different lists. In, in uh, Romans, uh, we have the little list we have here. And then the portion of Ephesians did something that kind of sounded like a list of spiritual gifts, but it was really more about church leadership, early church leadership positions. So I thought, well, maybe equipping is about helping people identify their spiritual gifts. And I don't know if you've read any of these lists before. We heard a little bit of it in Romans. If we'd thrown in the ones from Corinthians, it would be kind of a long list. Uh, prophecy, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, mercy, uh, speaking wisdom, uh, speaking knowledge, faith, 
um, healing, miraculous powers, discernment of spirits, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, and helps. And so uh, some ways that we might equip people um, for discipleship is to help them identify their spiritual gifts and, and identify places where they can use them. But it seems to me there are some just trappings in that too. So uh, Paul was writing about spiritual gifts to a congregation that was having difficulties because there were some people whose gifts, whose manifestation of the spirit seemed like extraordinary phenomena that were poured in literally from above, speaking in tongues discerning spirits, prophesying. And Paul wrote his list of spiritual gifts, not so much to make a complete list of spiritual gifts, but in order to put those gifts in context of all of the many other ways that people can be important and useful in service of the church, building up the community of faith, and in the world. And nevertheless, having those uh, speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues, prophecy, miracles, those extraordinary things on the list kind of makes it sound like spiritual gifts are um, an alien inhabitation and, and we need to just kind of try to figure out what alien is in us that is going to gift us. And, I think that's kind of taking Paul out of context because so many of the ways that we serve are using gifts, abilities, interests that are just normal and natural to our personalities and our station in life. And so I think that spiritual gifts can be a little bit of a red herring for us. In fact, the word spiritual gifts in the scriptures is charismata, and it just means grace effects. For everyone who believes in Christ, there are some grace effects in their lives, and those grace effects are all valuable and important, whatever form they take. None is, none is to be given more esteem or honor than others. It's a team effort to create a community of faith that builds each other up, that brings in new people, that raises and matures people in faith. So that was one of my difficulties. Another one is that those lists of spiritual gifts tend to talk about things that have jobs in the church. And so it, it tends to make us think about our gifts being used within the walls of the church. And so much of our discipleship is completely outside the walls of the church. In fact, maybe the most important things happen outside of our time here in the church. Now, it's true. And so, and so but because of that, lots of times when people start thinking about how am I going to be a disciple, they think about what job am I going to do in the church? And that is too narrow. Now, having said that, discipleship will always involve doing things to build up and sustain the community of faith. Because this is the place where we continue throughout our lives to encounter God's word, to learn, to grow, to have the Holy Spirit speak to us, it will be the place where we encourage other people, where we get to know one another well enough that we can offer accountability, encouragement, and, and maybe even sometimes counsel in ways that really make a difference because we know and trust each other. There will always be an important role and a need for people to just step up to help build up the community of faith both for the maturation of Christians in the body and for the bringing along 
of new people. But discipleship is a lot more than that. So I did insist on equipping Christians for discipleship. And uh, I was happy about that term, but as I started thinking more about discipleship, I thought, boy, that's a really churchy sounding word. What does that mean? What do people think of when they think of discipleship? I will say that our vision committee started out uh, working by talking about a kind of tentative definition or conception, a vision of discipleship. And this was it. Disciples walk humbly with Jesus, learning and growing with each step, and sharing that experience with others so that we can walk together, creating the world as God intends. Now, I loved that, and I, I think I, I, actually that language was not mine at all, but I really liked it, and I think I liked it probably uh, because it's about doing and moving and togetherness and it's about creativity together. Um, and uh, I think probably even the, on an emotional level, it really spoke to me because uh, I specifically had in mind um, my walking as a child. Uh, my father, for much of my childhood, we only had one car. And my dad uh, worked at Otterbein, taught at Otterbein. We lived fairly close. So usually mom had the car for errands she had to run, and dad would walk to work. And uh, for a couple years before I started school, I would walk to work with him a couple afternoons a week to sit in the lab and entertain myself while he had students in. And um, so my dad, who was 6'4 and had long legs, had a very uh, much faster walking pace than I did. And it was one of the most determined things of my childhood to be able to stretch my legs long enough to be able to keep his pace without making him slow down for me. And to this day, I'm a really fast walker because of my dad. So I like that idea, the image of, of walking alongside someone who is stretching us to go a little bit faster or grow our capacities. Walking with Jesus, I do like that. But it maybe doesn't give very much direction, very much specificity. I started thinking, if we're thinking about walking with Jesus, walking in Jesus' footsteps, doing what Jesus did, maybe, maybe we need to think about this not in terms of our spiritual gifts, but what did Jesus do? What were Jesus' activities that we're going to walk through life doing with him? And so I tried to look back at the Gospels and think of the, the activities of Jesus and kind of put them in modern language. Jesus was a, an ambassador for God. He taught and, inter and interpreted scriptures. He, he gave testimony about God's work and his life and the life of others. He created a spiritual community. He encouraged hospitality. He mentored people. He gave children prominence in the community. He counseled people needing direction. He challenged injustice and demonstrated justice and mercy. He listened to human need and paid attention to people who gave voice to those people who had been ignored by others. He forgave those who wronged him. He restored people to wholeness and health. He healed. He worked miracles turning situations of death-dealing into life-producing situations. And he communed regularly with God. I started thinking about Jesus' activities, and I thought, wow, those are a lot of skills there. Maybe equipping for discipleship is helping people work on, on skills and doing that in a modern key. Maybe today's modern healing community needs skills and knowledge to understand mental illness now that we have gained so much more knowledge. Maybe just like Jesus, 
crossed a lot of cultural boundaries as he was meeting the Samaritan woman and engaging with her. And as he encouraged the early church to take the Jewish faith into Greek culture and make that cultural transition, maybe we need to work today on intercultural competency as Christians. Maybe we need to start thinking about resourcing people to do uh, actual social justice advocacy. There are lots of different directions we could go. Was that the right approach? I'm not sure. We try to do some classes in stewardship that um, this past year we did financial education through the Financial Peace University. So that was kind of a skills-based approach to equipping Christians for discipleship. I suppose I've often hoped we would do equipping people for um, family roles, Christian parenting, or the many other roles that people play in uh, their families. But the directions are vast. And then I realized it's best to stick with Romans, maybe, because Romans starts out with the basic presupposition that the most fundamental act of discipleship is to offer our lives and to take every area of our lives and slowly transform them by considering God's values, God's purposes, God's plan in each one of them and maturing and realizing that vision. Our discipleship is about life. It's about making our Christian life more authentic in all of its realms as a citizen, as a parent, as a daughter or son, as a friend, as a community member. Discipleship is as broad as life itself is. And I suppose that's why it was hard for me to get a handle on. And what we really need then is to vision equipping Christians for discipleship together. If I were to go at this again, I might say something much more humble, preparing people for life. <laughs> but that doesn't sound very specific either. But the point of this part of the vision statement is that we are to take the experience of reconciliation with God and the peace that we have with God that we have found in this sanctuary and in this community. And to make that sanctuary in every other area of our lives and in our communities. And we have the freedom and the creativity of the Holy Spirit guiding us in doing that. And I will be so interested in your ideas about what you feel would be helpful in empowering and equipping you for discipleship, for living a full, authentic Christian life in every area of your life. So you have to write the ending for the sermon. Thank you. Send me an email.